I remember the coldest that I've ever been. It was a day or a, around the time of this year, this time year, and we were in the North Georgia mountains. I was in college, and we decided that we were going to go camping. Well, I wish that I was a better Boy Scout, and I wish that I would have taken a Boy Scout with us because none of us were very prepared at all. And there's one thing that we figured out very quickly that we needed. We needed more firewood than the two-hour log that we brought. And so that meant that by the time we got to the campsite, after hiking a half mile down to, the, to, the, to our campsite, the sun was already set and the moon was rising. And so that meant looking for firewood was becoming very precarious. And so the moon was shining in a certain area, and you could tell the way that the moon shone that there were trees that had fallen. And so we had the bright idea that we needed to get over there and retrieve the firewood because we could see it and there was a bunch of it and we didn't have to shine around in the dark. The only problem was is that we had to cross a creek, a North Georgia mountain stream, in order to get to this firewood. Well, so we began to look for a suitable place to cross. And the suitable place came upon us as we saw a tree bridge. Oh, this is great. Look, this tree is just right here for us. Well, I guess I forgot that trees, they start out like this, and I need my forestry major here to teach me this, but the trees start out like this, and then they go this way. They narrow towards the top. And I guess I had forgotten that. So we couldn't see. The tree looked really good from where we were, but we could not see what was beyond. So I couldn't tell if by the end of the thing, if I was shaken or the tree was shaken, but something was shaken. And sure enough, I went into the water and I was cold. I'm talking a March mountain stream cold. And I got out of the water and listened to my friend jeering at me. And so he just had to make it just a bit further. And guess what? I was laughing at him because misery loves company. We were in it together and we were freezing, but we decided to continue our quest and we decided to get the, um, the firewood, though this time we didn't have to worry with the tree. It didn't matter. We were already wet, so we went back and forth, back and forth, and got our firewood. But that night, I froze to death. I was so cold. Matter of fact, uh, my friend and I, I'm pretty sure that if he and I were telling the story, really what happened, we cuddled most of the night. We didn't really care. We were that cold. But we were praying for the sun to come up. That was the longest night of my life when I lost feeling in my fingers and toes. Cold. The sun finally did come up, however, and it was a joyous sight because we were able to then hike back up the mountain. We were able to fidget our way to the car, unlock the car, sit there for just a moment and de-thaw as we turned the heat on full blast, and then we went down the mountain made memories in college. That's what we do in college, right? We make memories that we'll never forget. But I want to talk to you today about the sun coming up. I want to talk to you about the sun coming up, the S-O-N. And when Jesus walked out of the tomb, the rays of new creation began piercing through the darkness for the first time since the dark curse of Adam since the dark curse of death from Adam. When Jesus walked out of that tomb on that day, as N.T. Wright says, the new creation began right in the middle of the old one. Consider that for just a moment. The new creation began right in the midst of the old one. Micah, he says it this way in chapter 4 and verse 2, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. Of course, we sing about that during Christmas time. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. This S-O-N rises. Isaiah says it this way. The people who walked in darkness, they have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them a light shone. As a matter of fact, when Matthew introduces Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, Matthew uses that Isaiah text to refer to Jesus as the light shining in the darkness. John says the same thing in John chapter 1. He says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then listen to this next phrase, we have seen His glory. They saw for the first time. Blinded eyes saw because they saw what through real light. 
And that's exactly who Jesus is, what Jesus is, light shining in darkness. And so in our text this morning, I invite you to take your Bible and join me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we've made it all the way through to this moment in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We've come a long way. We've looked at every line. We've tried to determine how the text is laid out. And we've come all the way to crest into the last chapter of this book. Now, we're going to take next week away from Thessalonians. We're going to take the next week, the next, and the next because of Easter. We're going to be preaching a series out of the Psalms, Psalm 22, 23, and 24. We're going to come back after that, and we'll finish Thessalonians in two more sermons. But in our text this morning, Paul reminds us that we are children of the light. We are children of the day. So let's read the Bible this morning. I'll read the first 11 verses. I'll read them aloud. You follow along with me. Now, concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then suddenly destruction will come upon them. Sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brethren. For the day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. Let's pray together. Thank you for the Word, God. Thank you that it is Spirit-inspired shows us a true picture of Jesus, and gives glory to You. So, Father, may we do well to do exactly what the Bible has called us to this morning, encourage one another, and build one another up. And may it be true of us that we are simply doing what we continue to do through encouraging one another in the gospel of our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. So, this morning I want to bring to bear four truths to encourage us about the end times that have come upon us in these times. To encourage us on the end times that have come upon us as well as the end times that will come upon us. So there's a dual reality that I'm trying to portray for you that the Scripture is rightly telling us about. There is the end that has come through Jesus and the end that is coming through Jesus. Both of those realities are, are sure. We right now are in the last days. And we have been in the last days for nearly 2,000 years. We have been in the last days since the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus, and the sealing of the Spirit. So we then are waiting on, listen to this language, the consummation of the age, the time when all things will be summed up. And at the centerpiece of summing up of all things is Jesus Christ. Consider what we do when we participate in the supper. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we, we partake of it now in remembrance then in hope of this Jesus who's coming. As often as you do, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes, past, present, and future, all united in our one Lord, Jesus Christ. And so we then are these certain people. We are, listen to the language, eschatological people. What does that mean? Thank you. Eschatowatl. We are last days people. The church of Jesus Christ is the people who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who are right now in the last days, who are longing for the last days to come. We are the Spirit-filled eschatological people. We are the Spirit-filled end times people. Some of you say that I didn't know that I was part of the end times story. You absolutely are here this morning. And what guarantees that is the person of Jesus Christ, who was, listen, who is, and what? Who is to come. 
all of that centers in Jesus. So number one this morning, I hope you're taking notes, as children of the light, there are four truths that need to be characteristic of us. Number one, we need to be sure of Christ coming. Be sure of Christ coming. I love the way that Paul begins. He says, and we know that it's a new beginning because of the way that the text is laid out. The first word in my ESV, which is a translation that I commend to you if you're looking for another translation, the English Standard Version captures it well by saying, now, now. In other words, we're moving on to something else. This letter of the Thessalonians is what we call an occasional letter. There was something that provoked Paul to write the letter. And so we're looking at the way that it's written to try to determine what it is that Paul writes. And he says this, you want to know about the end times. He says, I'm not really going to tell you much. And the reason that he's not going to tell them much is because he says, you already have what you need to know. Now, some of us are not satisfied with that. We want someone to lay it out for us in black and white, at least. We'd really like it in vivid color, 4K, really, what we'd really like, someone to show us. But remember this, remember this, as N.T. Wright often says too in another book that he wrote called Surprised by Hope. He says this, biblical prophecies about the end times are not like a Polaroid shot. This is the, his language. He says that it's more like a road marker in the mist. More like a road marker on a misty day telling us the direction that we're heading. And so I love the way that Paul writes. He says, you want me to tell you about the end times? Well, you really got all that you need to know. You're thinking, wait a minute, isn't this the guy who made it to the third heaven, whatever that is? Can't he give us just a little glimpse of these things? And here we're confronted with this fact that in every generation of Christian expression, there is the temptation to be overly preoccupied with a timeline of the end times. An over a temptation to be overly preoccupied with the timeline of the end times. Some of you say, "Well, we think that we're all fancy because we can we can think that we can put ourselves in little camps. We can say, I am historical premillennialist. I am dispensational premillennialist. I am a millennialist. I am post millennialist." And then some of you say, "I'm just pan tribulationist. I mean that it's going to pan out one day." To which we all should say simply to that, "You don't have a clue." when it's going to happen. None of us do. But our temptation is the same temptation that the apostles had to wrestle with. Remember what they said in Matthew chapter 24, right before the Olivet Discourse, right before Jesus starts getting some uh, in specificity with what's going to happen. He says, the disciples say, when will these things be? And that's our question. Remember what they asked Jesus after his resurrection? Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? That's our question. And we oftentimes neglect Jesus' response. What did he say to them? It's not for you to know times and seasons. And by the way, that word there, times and seasons in Acts, is the same words they hear that's used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 1 concerning times and seasons. Jesus says, it's not for you to know times and seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. And then what does he do? He takes our preoccupation and redirects it. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be presently my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so you see, when are these things going to be? Jesus says, let me redirect your attention to something more present and pressing. You're going to receive the power of the Spirit. What on earth is that? Here's what it's going to cause you to do. It's going to compel you to be witnesses of me, literally, literally witnesses of me, my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This morning, church, this morning, we are seeing the Great Commission happen. We're living it in action because the news of Christ crucified, Christ resurrected, Christ ascended, and Christ coming again didn't originate in Starkville, Mississippi. It had to come from us from somewhere. You say, where did it come from? It had an origin. You know where it came from? Jerusalem. And then where did it go? Samaria. And then where did it go? Judea. And then where did it go? To Starkville, Mississippi. 
the ends of the earth. And I don't mean that in a demeaning way as if we're in the ends of the earth. What I mean by that is we are right now far away from Jerusalem. What would we have to do? We'd have to, Nathan, what would we have to do? We'd have to go get on a plane, go to Atlanta, go to Atlanta, maybe go to New York, then go to Tel Aviv, and then take a bus ride. In other words, the gospel has come to us. We are those whom the end has come. And so God, He redirects our focus. In other words, Jesus said, you're to make it your preoccupation to be my witnesses, to go through the whole world, not pointing to a timeline, but pointing to a Savior who is coming. And I love the way the rest of the Acts account in Acts 1, when we see everyone's gazing up at Jesus who's ascended, which, by the way, I think that that's a beautiful vision that we should keep close. I love this. The Bible says, two men stood by them in robes of white. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but I grew up with that that Bible that we kept on the coffee table. Remember that big thing that had pictures in it? I really liked it during family Bible reading. It was the King James Version. And so that meant that I got to look at the pictures while Dad got to read the stories. And so I'd flip through the pictures. Andy, what are you doing? Why Why are you in Mark? We're in Exodus. Yes, sir. Let me go back. I was just looking at the pictures. But we remember that picture. And the text is so much better than any picture. The text says, or the picture has Jesus ascending and these two angels up in the heavens. But the text says it differently. The text has, here they are looking up, and then all of a sudden, two men come by right beside them. What y'all looking at? Is this something here? And redirects their focus. He says, why do you stand up looking at, why do you stand looking into heaven? And then what do they say? This same Jesus that you saw go into heaven is going to be the same one that you're going to see coming from heaven. In other words, get busy doing what he said. The last image they saw of Jesus was his glory ascending into heaven. The last word he said, go and tell the world what you've seen. And as you go, Rest assured that the same Jesus that you saw leave is the same Jesus who you're going to see coming again. And that doesn't matter if you're in the grave or you're alive here. That same Jesus is going to be seen by you. He can snatch you from the balcony. He can snatch you from the first row. He can snatch you from the graveyard. That same Jesus, you're going to see him come again. Look at the text. Isn't that what it says here in verse 10? So that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. That is, whether we are alive or whether we're dead, the point of it is, is that we're going to live with him. And so they saw this Jesus, and can you just imagine? It's no wonder that the gospel spread throughout the world so quickly, because they saw this image, and they were filled with the power of the Spirit. And we are to have, listen, the same vision before our eyes. This vision, and it's not any different than the text. I was having this conversation in the cove just a moment ago, and the 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 conversation was, we're in a better position than they were. This is what Peter says when he's writing his letter. He says, you're in a much better position than we were, even though we were on the mountain, we heard the majestic glory talking about the transfiguration. He says, you're in a better position than we are because you've got the Scriptures. You get to see, Peter would say, all my boneheadedness. You got to see places where I got it wrong. Don't do what I do, Peter says. Just do what Jesus says. And so, isn't it interesting that we have the same kind of vision before us? The vision of the text. The vision of a crucified, risen, ascended, and coming again Savior. I'll never forget one time going over to Jerusalem, and I hope that one day we can go together to Jerusalem, but I'll never forget one time going over there. And I got to be right at the Church of All Nations, right at the base of the Mount of Olives, looking at the Eastern Gate, and I got to attend a Mass for the first time. As a Southern Baptist, I got to attend a Roman Catholic Mass for the first time. Praise the Lord it was in English, because otherwise I already didn't have a clue, but if it was in French or something, I really wouldn't have had a clue. But you know what I heard that day? I heard the gospel. And every day, the gospel is proclaimed. Christ crucified. Christ risen. Christ ascended. Christ coming again. 
And that's the vision that we have. That's the vision that we have. It's Him that we proclaim. It's Him that we encourage all men, women, boys, and girls to run towards. We are sure of His coming. We don't have to know a timeline. And matter of factly, if Paul's words are true, and they are, and they apply to us, We don't have to know the timeline. We know what we need to know about His coming. And you say, what do we know about His coming? Well, here's what we know. You ready? We know that He's coming. And that's good news. Don't neglect that fact. I love the way the Bible ends. The Bible ends by saying, this Jesus says, I am coming soon. And then, of course, the last words, it says this, Revelation twenty two twenty. he who testifies to these things says, surely I'm coming soon. And then I love this word, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That's our prayer. Jesus is coming soon. And so we say, yes, come on. Yes, come on. So we know that he's coming. We know that it's going to be soon. And what else do we know? We know that when he comes, it will be, look at the text, like a thief unexpected and like a pregnant woman unstoppable. Like a thief unexpected and like a pregnant woman unstoppable. I'll never forget when Ezra was born. Ezra is our third born child. And when Ezra was born, the midwife, she didn't make it in time. I don't know. It was three in the morning. I guess she had to stop for coffee. Maybe she stopped at some red lights. I don't know. She didn't make it either way. And so they were trying to do everything they could to stop my wife from having that baby, to wait for the midwife. I mean, they, were, they, they told her, they said, don't, lay, don't raise up, honey. I remember them saying that, don't raise up, honey. We don't want you to push. That baby was coming. They did everything. Remember, Katie? They laid the bed almost like this so that she couldn't raise up. But that, that baby was coming. It was unstoppable. The midwife did make it, by the way. She got to deliver the placenta. Sorry for that information. She also got to cut the cord. It was fabulous. But anyway, she did something. We paid her. Anyway, it's great. We couldn't have done it without her. That's what we say. We couldn't have done it without you. Glad that you were here. Those nurses delivered that baby. And that's what we know about Jesus. It's unexpected. And it's unstoppable. Nothing you can do can stop it. Be sure this morning, Christian, be sure of Christ coming. Number two, resist the spirit of the age. Resist the spirit of the age. Did you know that our truth of the resurrection, if that wasn't strange enough, we have this other truth where we say that a man who hasn't walked the earth in almost 2,000 years is one day going to come back and walk it again. And that fact, listen to me this morning, is squarely resisted. No wonder it is. It's squarely resisted by those who desire to live a life of autonomy. You say, what do you mean by living a life of autonomy? Living a life of pure individuality, as if there's no consequences for your behavior. Phrases that capture the spirit of our age, slogans like, my body, my choice. Phrases like, my truth. I remember my granddad, he was a a chain smoker. He loved his cigarettes. Sometimes I think that he loved his cigarettes more than he did his family because we would implore him to stop smoking. And I remember my granddad saying, I'm not hurting anyone but myself. But I got to watch my granddad choke on his last breath, hooked up to 100% oxygen with emphysema, And he was absolutely wrong. When my mother crying over her daddy who died, me crying over my granddad, he was hurting much more than himself. We live in this world where the autonomous self is raised up to a level that God never intended it to be. Yes, he can be your personal Lord and Savior. He can be your Jesus. You can have an individual relationship with him. But it's not just about you and how you fancy It's about this Jesus who is coming again. And when he comes, all men are accountable to him. I remember having a conversation this past year with Governor Bill Lee of Tennessee. You should have seen the room when Bill Lee was in the room. Great man, godly man. I wish I could vote for him. When Bill Lee was in the room, I remember 
him talking to a bunch of, of uh, red Republicans about his policies, and everyone was erupting over the fact that he was pro-life. And then in the same breath, when he said that he was opening the state of Tennessee to be a sanctuary, a sanctuary state, the room fell silent. And I went up to Governor Lee, and I told him, I said, Governor Lee, thank you for your conviction. Thank you for your standing in the realms of Christian confession. I said, Governor Lee, you have to live your life with this fact. When you lay your head at night on that pillow, you have to remember that you're going to give an account for every decision that you make. And Governor Lee looked at me and he said, that's the way that I choose to live my life. Christian confession, the second coming of Jesus Christ, forces us to remember that there is a king who is coming, a king whom all men must give an account. And no wonder it's squarely resisted. No wonder it's squarely resisted. I like what Russell Moore says in his book, Onward. He recalls a conversation that he had with someone, to put it mildly, whose life choices didn't match Christian confession. She said, do you see how strange what you're saying sounds to us, to those of us, and listen to this language, to those of us here in normal America? Seriously, she said again, do you know how strange it sounds to me? Russell telling the story said he smiled and said, yes, I do. It sounds strange to me too. But what you should know is we believe in doing stranger things than that. We believe that a previously dead man is going to show up in the sky on a horse. We should keep Christianity strange because it makes it more beautiful. You see, the second coming is resisted, and it's replaced with a message of peace, peace, when there is no peace. And societies have been saying that since the days of Jeremiah. Listen, there will be no peace until Jesus comes. There will be no true peace until Jesus comes. Yes, we fight for it. Yes, we hope for it. But ultimately, we realize Jesus is coming, and until He comes, He who knows the secret intent of everyone's heart, until He comes, there will be no true peace. Another popular term today that captures the spirit of our age is woke. You ever heard that phrase? I'm sure you have. Woke is a slang way of saying awake. If we're awake, if we're woke, we're awake to specific topics like social and racial justice. And we need to be well aware. Listen, lest what is calling for us to be awake is actually lulling us into a deeper sleep. Christians are advocates of justice, but we have to keep the proper perspective. I've always agreed with John Stott and Billy Graham who said what they said on social justice in Lausanne, Switzerland in 1974. Listen to what they said. This is Article 4 if you want to look it up. To evangelize is to spread the good news that Christ died for our sins and was raised to dead, or raised from the dead according to the Scriptures, and that as the reigning Lord, He now offers the forgiveness of sins and the liberating gifts of the Spirit to all who repent and believe. In other words, that's what evangelism is. We're not simply trying to rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic. We're not trying to make the world a safer place to go to hell from. We're simply realizing this truth that there is a king who came, and there is a king who's coming, and all men are accountable to him. It further goes on and says this in Article 5. In other words, or excuse me, it says this, the salvation we claim should be transforming us into the totality of our personal and social responsibilities. Faith without works is dead. In other words, as Christians, we fight for social justice. In other words, we are advocates as Christians for social reform. But listen to me carefully. You cannot have social justice apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our culture is calling us to be woke in the middle of the night. They are calling for social justice apart from the justice of God demonstrated through the cross of Christ. And why on earth would we who have seen the light want to step back into the night? 
To this message we say simply that we are children of the day. We, in the words of Peter, are those who have seen the marvelous light of Jesus. He has called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. And we are no longer in the night. We have seen the light of the new creation, the morning star. To put it in another textual term, the morning star is rising in our hearts. We have seen Him with our eyes of faith, and one day our faith will be sight. As John says this in his prologue, in his gospel, in Him was life. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. How on earth can life be a light? Well, we'll have to save that for another day. But he goes on and says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Until that day, number three, we fight the fight of faith. You see, as children of of the light, what do we do? We're sure of Christ's coming, we resist the spirit of the age. And we fight the fight of faith. And remember this, talking about fighting. Remember carefully. Don't misunderstand me. Our fight is not with flesh and blood. Our fight is not with those who have an agenda contrary to ours. We don't fight flesh and blood. And listen carefully to this statement. We also don't use the same weapons of warfare that the world uses. However, we do wage warfare. Notice what happens at verse 6, and right before verse 6, there's a difference between those who are in darkness and those who are in light. We are not asleep and unaware. We're sober, not drunk. You say, well, drinking, what is that? I wish that that was simply talking about alcohol. That would make things a lot easier if I could just simply say to you, that means don't drink. No, no, it's so much more than that. It's a whole host of things that can make you drunk. Power, carousing, anything that will inoculate you from what matters most. And what matters most is Jesus. And so we stand against the dark as children of the day, and we put our armor on. We put our armor on. We stay sober so we can fight. And notice what comes back around to our attention. Here in verse 9, a triumvirate of faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. The three, the three strand cord of grace. Now, we first met this cord of grace in chapter 1 in verse 3. I'm looking at it now in my Bible where Paul recalls their work of faith, labor of love, and the steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. But here the Bible is calling us to put on the garment of grace held together by these three cords that protect us, the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of hope. We fight the fight of faith with the strength that God provides because our message is a message of hope. And that message of hope that we offer to the world is rejected by them. They have their own message. They say peace and security. They don't mean to resist the message. They're just those who are dwelling in darkness. They're not those who've seen the light. And so as Jesus says, they love darkness rather than light. And so they come and they resist, but we come to them and they say, no, no, this is peace. This is security. This is the way that you achieve it. And we simply come to them and say, as those whose eyes have been opened, literally, We were blind, but now we see. We were lost, but now we're found. We were dead, but now we're alive. We come to them and we say, no, no, no. The peace that you offer and the security that you're hoping in is one day going to come crashing down. And what's going to bring it down is this Jesus is coming. You can't get over that, Christian. Jesus is coming. And He's coming soon. And it'll be unexpected. And it'll be unstoppable. True peace, true hope comes with Jesus. As light pierces darkness, so we hold tight to these truths. But notice this. Let's keep going into the text. Perhaps the most important part for us to notice at verse 9. Look at verse 9. And here we have another phrase that greeted us right at the beginning in chapter 1. 
a phrase of so much controversy, but it shouldn't be. It's a phrase of controversy, but God intends the phrase that's controversial to be a phrase of security. Chapter 1 and verse 4 says, For we know, brethren, loved by God, that He, that he has chosen you. And then in verse 9 it says, look at this word, for God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are destined. Put, them to, put the two together, destined, chosen of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, when He comes, the dead are raised, and salvation is going to come with Him. We, look at what it says, to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a salvation still waiting for us. It's a salvation where we'll be forever with the Lord. Look at verse 10, another phrase, perhaps the most explicit reference to something called substitutionary atonement, where Christ died for us. Substitutionary atonement just simply means for us for us. Look at the Bible. It says, this Jesus who died for us, who died for us, it was all for us, all so that we could live with Him. Listen, amazing grace, all on account of amazing love. Some of you are here this morning, and you need to listen to this. You need to listen carefully. Salvation is not based upon your works. It's not based upon what you can do, what you will do, what you might do, or what you did. Salvation is based not on your feelings. Salvation is based upon God's work for you and His feelings of you. You say, God has feelings for me? Oh, yes, He does. God loves you. The Bible says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. The, God says, can a, nursing, can a nursing mother forget her child? So I can never forget you. God says, I have engraved you on the palm of my hand. Your ways are ever before me. I remember you. I see you. I will move heaven and earth to be with you. I will move heaven and earth so that you can be with me for forever. You see, look at this phrase again. Look at verse 10. It says that whether we are awake, and that's a reference to life, or asleep, that's a reference to death. We learned that from what came in chapter 4 and verse 13 and following. Whether we're, alive, whether we're awake or asleep, we might live with Him. God loves you so much that nothing can separate you from His love. That's Romans 8. Nothing. Not even death. Death is powerless compared to the love of God for you. He loves you, and He wants you to be with Him for forever. And so this morning, Quiet your souls. You're thinking about those controversial things. When will these things be? You're thinking about these controversial things of destined and chosen. Be quiet. Rest your soul, number four, in God's salvation. It's something that He's accomplished for you. Some of us have become so concerned about all these other issues that we neglect this fact that He who died for us, so that whether we're awake or asleep, that we might live with Him. Look at verse 11. What an amazing therefore. Therefore, encourage one another 
and build one another up just as you're doing. Just as you're doing. You're already doing it. Just do a little more. Encourage and build one another up. This is the faith that builds up. This is the faith that edifies. Listen, the important thing is not so much that we are children of the day, but it's that God, who is light, has shown His glory towards us and makes us His own, transforming our darkness into His marvelous light. You see, this God died for you so that you could be with Him for forever. And you know what the Bible calls forever with God? Heaven. Heaven is waiting for you. You simply have to believe. You simply have to trust. And it's my prayer that you can say, I do believe, and I am trusting. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, thank You for Your salvation. Thank You that You've called us into marvelous light. Lord, we don't even know what marvelous light is. We're so grateful that that Word captures as much as we can understand of it. And it's marvelous. Father, it's my prayer for everyone in the room right now that they'll say in the quietness of their heart, God, I love you. Maybe they've been saying that for a long time. Maybe today they feel compelled to say that for the first time. God, I love you. And Father, I pray that in the quietness of their heart, They would hear you respond back to them. I love you too. And I have loved you with an everlasting love. Nothing will separate you from my love. So Father, as we end this time together, we end it the way that your book ends with an assurance that Jesus is coming. And so we pray, even so come. In Jesus' name, amen.